And what about global, global labor and AI? There's a global labor shortage and the need for AI. Well, we've talked about it. There's a race to deploy AI systems. That's not changing. There's a lot of visibility and it's just a matter of time before markets really start to see the products and services that get people excited. So AI spending visibility is there. Stocks can wobble like they have been recently, but again, that's just markets trying to discount the future. And if you think stocks are expensive, keep in mind Nvidia is only at 27 times earnings. Costco is at 45 times, Walmart's at 39 times, and Cisco got to 210 times in the dot-com era. So it's still not expensive. And as for easing financial conditions, well, we've got a dovish Fed. So that's really a tailwind. But remember, this is also going to drive innovation from banks because now they're going to have capital flowing. And of course, that's bullish for crypto. Um, and as we talked about, Wall Street is, is embracing the blockchain now. We talk about bubbles all the time. Is this the sign of one? When we start the bubble question first, which is a very important one, and the thing about this economy that's really interesting is there's so much concentration, and you're seeing it in the public markets, of course. So NVIDIA is more concentrated as a single stock than you've seen probably in 40 years. MAG, 7, 30% plus of the, you know, of the S&P, and the tracking error is totally off. And then you're seeing that actually in the private markets as well. And so if you look at the uh, private capital that's gone into just the large foundation models, the frontier labs, uh, that represents a higher percentage of the dollars that have gone into venture capital than almost any other time in the last 10 years. And that's because the narrative is so clear right now, which is that everybody wants to build the new compute stack, the new inference stack, and the new demand stack for AI. So whether or not that's a bubble, actually has a couple of inputs that I'm looking at personally. One of which is, is there gonna be enough demand for all this build out? And we should talk about that. Mm -hmm. Is the deprecation for all this infrastructure actually going to work in such a way that the unit economics makes sense? Uh, are the multiples that these companies that are concentrating all this capital that we're trading at reasonable? And when I look at each one of those today, it actually seems more rational than you'd expect. There's one place that I'm tracking where there's a bit of concern which is the bond. So there's a big debt load that a number mm -hmm. of these big hyperscalers and companies like Oracle and CoreWeave have taken on where there is a point of concern, but on the multiples, on the deprecation uh, schedules, and then on the, you know, and then on the demand, I actually feel pretty confident that we're in a, we're in a healthy place. Do you think that in terms of the large language models themselves that they all become commodities? I mean, part of it is that they all may ultimately, if they're as successful as they wanna be, you'd think that they would all converge. There's two answers to that. The first answer is, yes, they become a commodity the same way that the hyperscalers made the, you know, the cloud storage a commodity. That's a cloud storage commodity that's growing at 10 to $30 billion of revenue a year, 30 to 40% plus year over year. So even if that were a commodity, it's actually a really good business because there's just so much net demand. So that's Path one. Path two, which is the path that I think we're actually seeing, is that each one of these models actually starts to specialize on certain areas where they become really, really strong. And so you're seeing Anthropic has really d done a really, really important big investment into coding, into Claude, which is actually their enterprise agent. And between enterprise and coding, they actually have a true differentiating advantage in their technology and how that technology is able to deliver results for end users. Whereas ChatGPT and OpenAI is really focused on the consumer use case and they're focused on media, things like Sora, things like their Whisper model, which are audio and video. And then of course the chat model, which is really, really important for consumers. And then Google, which is, you know, the big monster is kind of doing it all. Uh, but I think that actually is going to play out even more deeply as these companies further invest into each of these lanes. Final question. Is there a way to invest in this in some other way that for, for a public investor today that doesn't seem obvious to you? Yes. Uh, if I were looking at it, I would actually be thinking hard about the agentic app layer. So the reasoning models just came out over the last 18 months, and these reasoning models are finally making enterprise use cases useful. I'm seeing it in insurance, I'm seeing it in law, I'm seeing it in healthcare, uh, commerce. And so I would be looking for companies that are spending a lot of energy and time figuring out how to actually replace services with AI in productive ways. Uh, Peter Orsag earlier was talking about the way the Lazard is doing it. And I actually think at a stock picker level, there's individual names where there's an incredible amount of margin expansion available. From investor perspective, you can spend all the capex you want when you're beating and raising earnings estimates. But if that starts to slow down, 
then you start getting a little bit more nervous. So it be Five families, so to speak, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Meta, and OpenAI in partnership with Oracle. They're going all out to build these data centers anywhere they can. They're even in space. They're each trying to outspend the competition. If not dominate everything, then at least to keep rivals for snapping up their own core businesses. Meta, which many people feel has actually fallen behind, is trying to protect its social turf. Amazon's trying to block out anyone from doing retail. Microsoft wants to block companies that might intrude on both their lucrative consumer and business applications. Nobody wants to come in against Windows because they know they'll be crushed, though. And OpenAI, they want to come after everybody. With a budget of at least $300 billion for Oracle loan and many other commitments made to many other companies totaling a whopping $1.4 trillion. This reckless, imprudent data center spending has been collapsing the value of all the stocks. Many have tried to rein them in, but to no avail. A lot of that's because OpenAI is funded by venture capitalists. The company seems to be willing to spend itself to death. The strategy is almost suicidal, but they're private. Watch this. I don't think... AI is going to dramatically reduce jobs, like, unbelievably next year. I think AI is real. We've got to figure out some way to put guardrails around AI, um, and it, but it will eliminate jobs. That doesn't mean that people won't have other jobs. You know, my advice to people would be, you know, critical thinking, learn skills, learn your EQ, learn how to be good at a meeting, how to communicate, how to write. You'll have plenty of jobs. And, and uh, if it does happen too fast for society, which is possible, you know, we can't assimilate all those people that quickly, we should get ahead of it and maybe have some programs in place, you know, that can handle this if it starts happening too fast. I also don't think you can see it all happen this year. It isn't going to be like it's this year. I mean, like, if you look at this year, you have a huge amount of construction that needs to take place. And to do that construction, you need roads and trucks and drivers. You need servers, you need uh, fiber, you need all that. So it's going to cause probably more jobs in the short run. NVIDIA isn't trading on hope. It's trading on visibility. Hyperscalers have already locked in orders well into next year. Governments are lining up. Enterprises are just getting started. That's why Ives believes the market is still underestimating the size of this cycle, not overestimating it. The $1,000 target isn't about a straight lineup. It's about what happens when the market fully prices in NVIDIA as the central nervous system of AI. When investors stop valuing it like a semiconductor company and start valuing it like critical infrastructure. And remember, every major tech revolution had one company everyone thought was too expensive, until it wasn't. Microsoft in the 90s, Apple in the 2000s. NVIDIA may be that company for the AI era. So whether NVIDIA hits $1,000 this year or next isn't the real question. The real question is whether AI spending slows. And right now, all the data says the opposite. Spending is accelerating. Use cases are expanding. And the moat around NVIDIA is deeper than most people realize. That's why Dan Ives is making the call. Not because it sounds bold but because the fundamentals are forcing his hand.